change the song. At some point, I am hoping to say something that will make sense of this silly <laughs> sermon title slide. My kung fu is better than your kung fu. You never heard anything like that before, I'll bet. Um, faster than a speeding bullet, right? More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Unless he's wearing a kryptonite suit. Right? Like, Superman is kind of useless in a kryptonite suit. Well, I mean, he's probably still a nice guy and you can have a chat, but he can't be a Superman, right? Like, without power, he's powerless. Is that kind of silly? But it's just true, right? Um, we, I saw a, uh, a movie from 2015 called Into the Forest, and uh, not Into the Woods with Meryl Streep, but Into the Forest, and, and it was all about, like, it just happened, and people don't know what's happening, but the power grid is out, and people are trying, you know, this man and his daughters, they live kind of in the mountainous, you know, area near a small town, and, and uh, like, one of the, the daughters is still practicing for the SAT, and the other is still practicing for a, pian a, a dance recital she's trying to, to um, have. And, and they just don't realize that life is going to change dramatically because there's no power. <laughs> like, what good is your refrigerator without power? How about your microwave? Your computer? No internet? Right? Your cell phone? I mean, just try to think for a moment what your life would be like if you had no power. And of course, you know, services break down and they're not delivering gas to your neighborhood so you don't have gas for your car. No power. How radically is your life going to change? It, most everything you own is useless, right? It's, it's funny, the movie points out we've only, we've only had power basically for about 200 years, right? Somehow we survived for thousands of years without power. But right now, take away our power... And, and life is like, whoa, what are we going to do? Right? In, uh, in our text today, we're going to get to a place where we're, we're going to see Paul saying that there's a way for the cross of Christ to be emptied of its power. Now, it's not like when that happens, it actually suffers damage, like like, nobody can do anything that would, would prevent the cr cross of Christ from having power, like somewhere else, to a different people. And it'll always have the power that, that Jesus, you know, gave it when he died on the cross for our sins. It's always going to be there. But there, there are, there's a way that Paul describes that it can lose its power, at least in your life and in the lives of the people that you and I are supposed to be influencing. And so, so in our text, we're going to get to that, that place uh, where, where we see there's a way for the cross of Christ to lose its power. Now, uh, last week, if you remember, we, we got to see this, uh, this great video that told us about the, the letter to 1 Corinthians. Anybody see that with me? Some of you here? Was that great? Those are awesome. I hope you go home and watch those things or come on Wednesday and watch them with us. And it's just great to be able to see an overview of the, these books of the Bible. Um, but we saw that Paul's goal in trying to help the church, especially there at Corinth, but I think it's preserved for us because it's supposed to help us too. Is that right? So Paul's goal is in everything, as, as that video pointed out, in every issue the church was facing, his goal was to get their minds focused where? On Christ. Because in essence, the problem stemmed from the fact that they weren't. <laughs> fixing their eyes on Jesus. And so, and so we saw that's the template of how the book would work. And then, and then we talked about uh, the early uh, the introduction and the, the blessing that's in the, in the uh, beginning of chapter 1. And in there we saw that Paul is modeling that you know everything he says kind of brings everything back to Jesus Christ. Nine verses we counted how many times? Anybody remember? How many times did it say Jesus Christ? Nine times. In nine verses, focusing on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. That's, that's the goal, to bring it all back, to a focus on Jesus Christ. Well, then he enters the, the body of this letter, 
begins in verse 10. But, but if we read the whole letter, what we find is, it looks like Paul initially, he was going to write this letter anyway. Because in chapter 7, he says, now for the matters you wrote about. Right? And then he talks about some marriage issues that they were concerned about. Uh, chapter 8, he talks about food sacrifice to idols and go on and talks about spiritual knowledge. Uh, talks about church stuff at 9 and 10 and 11. And then he gets to the point where he says, now about spiritual gifts. And then uh, the 16, now about the collection for the saints. So, so Paul had intended to write this letter all, all about these uh, answers to these questions and issues that they had raised to him. But before he gets to any of that, this takes priority. This, what's going on in Corinth, takes priority. Paul had some friends. Chloe and her household had made a trip to Corinth. Seems like they were on business there. They returned to Paul. While there, they visited the church, and they found the situation in the church was not centered on Jesus. <laughs> People were centering on themselves. And so, and so Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, keeping that in view, that, you all, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Three times Paul used the word same here. He basically says, I want you to speak the same things, have the same mind and the same judgment. I want you to, to be the same. Because what they were doing is they were trying to distinguish themselves from one another. And not just on a level plane, what were they doing? They were trying to say, you're down here, and I'm up here. Right? And so, and so Paul is saying, you need to be the same. You need to have the same love. You need to be one. Um, there, a, there's a, a few theological issues in our text today, and I want to deal with them. Two of them are kind of ours. One of them is other traditions. But I just want to throw it out and just speak to it, because here they are in our verse. Uh, it, is, it is unfortunately too common when people read this passage. Uh, I think the King James says that you are to be perfectly united in mind and thought. Anybody remember that text? Okay, this passage has been used to say that the true church exists in those who have uniformity. Anybody ever hear that? It, it, in, in other words, unless you and I have the exact same doctrine about all the Bible issues and all the practices of what we do in church, unless we have the exact same thing, then we are not both the church. Either I am or you are, or neither of us are, but we can't both be, because the true church is, uh, exists in uniformity. Now here's how I know that that's just not right. First, I know Paul. I know he says in Philippians, and, I'll, and, if, and if on some matter you think differently, and he doesn't say you're all going to hell, <laughs> he says if on some matter you think differently, God will reveal that to you too. Only let us to live up to what we've already attained. Philippians 3 something, 14 or somewhere. Uh, he doesn't say if you think differently, you're toast. <laughs> and even here in this text, even here in this text, if Paul is saying that the church only exists where there is uniformity from what we already know in this letter, is there uniformity in Corinth? What? No, it doesn't appear like it. And Paul knows it. In fact, he's writing this whole letter because it's not. And so what had Paul just said last week about this group of people? Do you remember? He basically said, and you can read it in verse 4 through 9, you're the beautiful church. You're... You've received every gift. And, and the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. And God is faithful and will keep you to the end. Was Paul doubting that he was talking to Christians when he wrote this? I mean, there is an issue we deal with in chapter 5 about one guy. But the body of believers who are a mess, no, Paul doesn't cut them off and throw them away. It's just... 
It's so ironic, it's terribly ironic that a, ver a verse that Paul is writing to bring unity has been the cause of so much division. It's just silly. Uniformity. My goodness, does that exist anywhere? Did anybody watch Newlywed Game last night? <laughs> one, of our, one of our closest uh, relationships in life will be uh, the two shall become one flesh. Is that right? So you'd think after 30 or 40 or 50 years, right, we'd all think the same thing, right? Anybody have that experience? Anybody married in here for 30 or 40 or 50 years? Raise your hand. Now keep them up if you and your spouse just agree on everything. Wow, I got one back here. I think the other spouse may be a deferrer. <laughs> but at least in most people's experience, right? Uniformity, it just, it's, it does, it's a unicorn, right? It doesn't exist. What Paul is calling for here is not uniformity. He's calling for the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He's calling for all of the, the church to be of one mind and one goal and one purpose in one body. Um, this isn't real, okay? It's our imagination. But you ever watch movies where uh, some alien's attacking Earth? Anybody watch these movies? Where aliens are attacking Earth? What happens to all the nations that have all kinds of problems with each other? Yeah, I don't know if this really would happen, but at least in our imagination we believe that when somebody is trying to destroy humanity or the earth, we all get together and we have the same goal and we're of the same mind and we want to conquer them because we want to save humanity. That's what Paul is looking for. We have a common enemy. There is a, a dark forces of the spiritual realms talked about in, in the New Testament. And, and Christians are called to be one in Christ, to be a spiritual power, as, as we talked about last week, to be put on display against those dark forces. We are called to exhibit the oneness of Christ, to destroy the darkness. Now, that happens because, because we put aside our petty squabbles that really mean nothing when you're thinking about saving souls. That's what Paul is going for here. Not uniformity. It doesn't exist. And so he's calling them to be of the same mind, the same judgment, speak the same thing, which is, which is a thing that focuses on Jesus and not on themselves. But that's not what's going on. He says, it's reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. Does he think they're not Christians? Are they really his brothers? Like they were all born of his mom and dad? No, they're all born of Christ. And they are really his brothers in Christ. But he says, what I mean is that each one of you says... I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Here's what I want you to notice. I mean, if it was me, and, and I, had, I was dealing with a body of Christ where people were saying these things, I don't know, I'm, I might be tempted to say, one of you got it right. Right? Hopefully not the ones that said, I follow Randy, right? Hopefully that's not the ones Paul would talk about, right? But which ones would he say got it right up here? That makes sense, doesn't it? But Paul doesn't go there. As far as I can tell, he doesn't see anything better about I follow Christ than I follow Apollos or I follow Paul. At least not in this context. You see? Because in all of these, even the people who say I follow Christ appear to be saying it to say, and you don't. I'm different than you. It's still separating. What would the right answer be if somebody wanted to speak into I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas or Peter? The right answer would be the people saying, but, but we follow Christ. That, that's the spirit we're looking for here. 
So that's what's going on here. The people are focusing attention on themselves. Okay? So, so what are they doing here? I'm telling you, this is the stuff kung fu movies are made of. They're saying, they're saying, my kung fu is better than your kung fu because my master can beat up your master. Right? Like, I'm of Paul because Paul's the one who came by here with the gospel. And he, and Jesus snatched him right up out of the world on the road to Damascus. And he spent three years in Arabia and visions. And he'd, he'd been taken to some heavenly state. And, and, and he's shown all kinds of powerful miracles and stuff. I'm with Paul. That's my guy. And another guy said, well, you know what, Paul? He doesn't really speak that well. He's, you know, kind of clumsy with his words. He, he's not really a great orator. I'm going with Apollos. I mean, he's mighty in the scriptures and he's a great preacher. And I kind of like Apollos. I'm going with him. Right? And others are like, well, no, but Peter, you know, he's one of the original 12. Jesus gave him the keys of the kingdom. He opened the gospel up to the Jews in Jerusalem and to the Gentiles in Cornelius' household. I'm going with Peter. All of, that, all of that is not an attempt to try to raise up those guys. And they don't want it, by the way. Paul doesn't want it. We know Apollos doesn't want it. Peter doesn't want it. Jesus doesn't want him doing that. But, but that's not why they're doing it. They're not doing it to raise those men up. Why are they doing it? And, and we do this today. People do this, right? Um, uh, you know, I guess for guys, like maybe it's, they, maybe they want to know what, what's on your paycheck, right? Um, I don't know. I, I think, and so don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to pick on the women, but I think I get the impression that in certain circles, if, you're wear, if you have a Dooney and Burke purse, you're probably special. Or, or in other circles, if you have Louis Vuitton, you're probably really special. Am I right about that? Is there somebody better than Louis Vuitton? Mary Kay. <laughs> a, little push, a little promotional here. You know what I mean by that, right? It's like... You know, uh, I, I, you know I, there, there's a movie a long time ago. It was an old movie. I think it was um, oh, called The Game with Michael Douglas. Anybody ever see that? I just can't forget. He's, he, he's in this thing. He's racing around. He's, he's, he thinks he's being chased. And he, he's climbing up, trying to get away. And he loses one of his shoes. And he says to whoever the girl is that's, that's with him, he says, oh, there goes $1,000. And she said... You buy a pair of shoes for $1,000? And he said, well, just that one. <laughs> it's like some people live there, right? Um, so I guess I don't know all the examples of how we do it, but we do it. We, you know, we, maybe we want to have the, the bigger house or the, ni you know, the nicer car or whatever. It is, but, we, but it's not just to have them, but when we're trying to say something about ourselves, when we're finding identity in that stuff, that title, that, that paycheck, that, that purse or shoes or whatever it is, we're doing it too. We do it just like them. And, and what we need to understand about Corinth is um, this isn't just like a random thing happening to them as a culture. They're, they're actually probably bringing in their culture when they're having these problems, these kind of uh, hey, look at me stuff. It, it's, probably, it's probably a carryover from their culture. It's probably very natural for them to break into these kind of uh, divisions. Because, I, I don't know if you knew this, but Corinth, while being a very ancient city, at the time Paul started the church there, they were actually a very recent population. Um, in like 147 B.C., a guy named Lucius Mummius, the mummy, Came in, and in, in Rome's battle, trying to wipe out more of the Greek uh, power, came in and, and wiped out what they call the Achaean League, League but, but wiped out everybody in Corinth and kind of destroyed it. And, and they killed all the men and sold all the women off to slavery and left it sort of desolate. And so Corinth, which was an ancient city, was kind of left empty and dead and, and destroyed. And then about 100 years later, under Julius Caesar, like in 44... He, he needed Corinth as a, a main city and, you know, its ports and everything is very valuable. So he repopulated it with Romans and with Greeks and with uh, Jews. 
and with Syrians and people from Egypt, and he repopulated it. So this is only a, this is like less than a hundred years from the time that Paul is in Corinth. So how much melting pot happens in, in 80 or 85 years? You, you see what I mean? It's a fairly new population of segments of peoples and cultures. And so that's one reason why they would be quick to kind of have this mentality of, well, I'm different than you because I'm this kind of person. But the other reason is from the, you know, even though the Romans took over, everything was still Hellenized. It was all very Greek. And, and people prized uh, wisdom. And, uh, and it may not have been real wisdom, but it was something everybody thought was wisdom. And so if you were the guy at the party who had something new to say, if you were the guy at the party or the girl at the party who had a perspective that people hadn't thought of, and they would go, whoa, you'd be the one they all listened to. You, you'd be the, the life of the party. And so people wanted to be the life of the party. They wanted that kind of status and clout and, hey, look at me. Some people would hire, like a philosopher, to live in their home and, and just uh, have conversations with them about the current issues and, and speak wonderful things that, so that they, when they went to their parties, they could be that guy or that girl. And so it was very natural, it was part of their culture to be a people who would break into I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. One other theological point related to the last one I kind of mentioned about, about um, being perfectly united in mind and thought. Just one more here I want to throw out. And this one also is uh, kind of in, in our heritage. The last one's going to be in other heritages. But here, you know, if somebody is segregating themselves by name, is there an English term for that? What do we call it when you segregate, segregate monies by name and type? What is it? Yeah, those are different denominations of money. Okay? Don't get mad at me, but I'm going to say this. These guys in Corinth were technically and literally doing what? Denominating themselves. They just were. Now, I've heard a lot in my Christian life, if you have denominated yourself, you're going to hell. You're not a true Christian. Am I the only one who's heard that? These guys have denominated themselves. They have identified themselves with a particular name. That's what it means. I can't find anything in the passage that makes me believe that Paul has cut them off. I'm just saying. If you think that's not true, then come see me later and show me why. I can't see anything here where Paul says, you, have, you are now disqualified as a Christian because you have denominated yourself. Now, is it good for us to be denominating ourselves so that we can separate from each other? No, it's not good. It's better if we all speak the same thing and are one. That's way better. And it's why our tradition used to say, let's be Christians only. But they would also say, we want to be Christians only, but not the what? We're not saying we're the only Christians. Now, some people started saying we're the only Christians. And I'm just saying you can't get that from this verse. That's all I want to point out. We're in this passage. It's not really the point of this sermon, but we're in the passage. And there it is. These people are denominating, and Paul doesn't kick them out. So let's be like Paul. Is that too much to ask? Let's be like Paul. Let's have more grace. Let's let God decide where the boundaries are. Okay, so we press on. So Paul's answer is three rhetorical questions that are all answered no. His, his answer is, is Christ divided? Well, is he? Of course not. Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. All of these... Uh, all of these are the answer no, but they're all designed to say you have taken your focus off of Christ. You have taken it off of Christ. You're not thinking about the fact that you are one in one body in Christ. You're not thinking about the fact that it's, it's because he cru was crucified for you that you are one with God. You, you're not keeping that in your mind that he died for you. And you've lost sight of the fact that when you were baptized, it wasn't Paul or somebody else you were identifying with. 
When you were, when you were baptized, you identified with this Jesus who saw that the way to truly be the best and the greatest and the most glorious was to lay his life down for the will of God and to raise others up. That, that's the gospel right in there. And we identify with Jesus, and, and by being baptized, we're saying we, are, we want to become. We want to die to ourselves and become like Jesus. That's what it's all about. And so Paul says, well, you weren't baptized in my name. And then we get this little, uh, this little piece by Paul. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Listen, I love that he says that. I love it. Because it says to me, he's not keeping track. Isn't that great? I mean, I've heard people say, man, I've baptized 827 people. I don't know. In fact, I don't even know everyone I baptized. I forget. I don't even remember all the weddings I've done, and that's bad. I mean, I wish I did, and if I did yours, I remember it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's some I don't. And, it, and I can look at the pictures and see myself there and just not be able to place myself there. <laughs> but I'm certainly not keeping track of the baptisms. I'm not. And, and I see Paul, he's saying, hey, that's not what's important. We're not trying to keep track of that stuff. If I did that, I'd be lifting myself up and saying, hey, look at me. But I, I want to say something about, uh, so this is a third theological thing I need to throw in. It's not our tradition's problem, but other traditions. They read this passage out of context. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Out of context, you yank it out, and you say, here, here's where Paul says baptism is not important. He, he wasn't sent to baptize. Well, put it back in context. You know, Paul, Paul did baptize people. He taught some deep theology about baptism. And the fact of the matter is, he, he actually was sent to baptize. Uh, the, the commission in Matthew, at the end of Matthew, is for all disciples. Uh, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. That is for all disciples. Paul had that commission as well. So why would he say this? Well, my goodness, words only, the words themselves only carry, what do they say, 7% of the meaning? I mean, the rest is in context and, and in sometimes inflection and all these other things, but, but you've got to get to what he meant. And what he meant was, Jesus did not just send me around to dunk people. He, he didn't send me to get people dunked. The goal, my whole goal in life is not to get you dunked. My goal is to get you connected to Jesus. To get you to lay your life down and see in what God has done at the cross the power to transform your life and to, and to give you peace with God. My, Paul would say, my goal is to bring you, to reconcile you to Christ. That's his goal. Now, of course, faith, repentance, and baptism are in that stream. But they're not the goal. The goal is the unity of spirit through the bond of peace, the love. The goal of this commandment is love, Paul says, I think, to Philippi. So, so, of course, he could say, look, if you're going to make baptism somehow about you or about me or, or make it say somehow you're special because you had a special teacher baptize you, you're still claiming your kung fu is better than others' kung fu because you have a better master. If you're still doing that, that's the world. You brought that in from the world. And that's not what Christ is about. And so if, and Paul's saying, so if baptism is a stumbling block, well, well, forget about that. that you're, you're getting hung up on that. You need to know the goal is to get you connected to Christ. Now go read Paul's theology about baptism and you'll, it's clear. Of course he baptized and taught baptism. But his point is, it's not about that. It's about Jesus. It's about transformation. It's about becoming like him. And if all you're doing is bringing the world into it and saying, hey, look at me, it, it means nothing. You've lost it. Okay, so Paul identifies these Corinthians, and, he, and here's what I love. He doesn't really say that they are emptying the cross of its power. He doesn't say they are. But he does say what they are doing is their focus is not on Jesus. They have focused on themselves in lifting themselves up and putting others down. 
What Paul says, so instead of saying, ah, you guys, Paul says about himself, if I were to focus on myself and preach in such a way that every, everybody thought I was cool and baptize in such a way that everybody would think they were cool because I baptized them. Paul is saying, if I did all of those things which you guys are doing, then I would be emptying the cross of Christ of its power. But Paul's not doing that. But somebody is. And he's implying, <laughs> this is exactly what you guys are doing. If I did what you guys were doing, I'd be emptying the cross of its power, right? If A equals B and C equals B, then A equals what? C, right? I mean, it's just, he's implying it. So how do we apply this to our church? How do we apply this to me and you, okay? Or you and I. No, you and me. <laughs> because, to be honest, even though I believe if we sat down and, and talked about everything we believe theologically and everything we believed about, you know, practically about what to do as a church, I believe we would get down to where some of us were like, well, I kind of follow more of a traditional way of thinking about things. And some of us would say, well, I'm kind of following more of a progressive way of thinking about things. And, and some of us would say, well, I'm, I'm just following what I think the scriptures say. Right? Wouldn't we get there at some point? I think we would. But the fact that we're not wearing signs and banners and, and doing this to each other is awesome. I mean, so we're not emptying the cross of its power in this way. And I get that. I'm, I'm happy about that. We should celebrate that. But is there a way we might be emptying the cross of its power? And I thought of one. Don't get mad at me. Um, let me ask you this. How many in here are desperately in need of the grace of God and the mercy and the forgiveness of the cross of Jesus Christ. I knew that. Me too, I knew that. But here's the thing, and I, I might not have this kind of perspective, except my niece runs a Celebrate Recovery group across town, across point. Her name's Maureen Clark. I knew her as blue growing up. She always had blue hair. I didn't call her blue, that was just what she wanted to be called. Um, but anyway, she runs, at Crosspoint, this Celebrate Recovery group. And I know I've talked about it before, but I, we went Thursday night again. And, uh, and i got to tell you, um, there is no question. There, there's just no, there's no hiding it. There's no question when you're in that group that all of those people, the very foundation of why they're a group, all of them are desperately seeking the power of the cross of Christ. Sorry, I'm pressing buttons again while I'm trying to preach. Man, okay. All of them are desperately laying their lives down at the cross. And, and so everyone who gets up there who talks will say, Hi, my name is Randy Elliott. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. And, and I struggle with this particular hurt, habit, or hang-up. But they don't say those words. They say lust or drugs or, or depression or anger or cutting myself. What, a whole range of things. And they get up and they say, and, and when they're getting their chip and it's a, a one-day chip or a 30-day chip or a six months or a year, they come up and they say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a grateful believer. And this chip is for, you know, a, a, a drug addiction. And everybody claps. And it's kind of weird if you don't get it. You're like, this guy's a drug addict and everybody's clapping for him. Doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense because they're not clapping that he, he's uh, struggling with drugs. They're clapping because he's struggling <laughs> with the drugs. And he's bringing that struggle to the cross of Jesus Christ. And they know that when he brings it to the cross, he's going to find healing and help and hope. And he's going to be redeemed and he's going to be restored. 
And that's going to bring glory to God because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And everybody knows it. And they all do it. That is the basis of their fellowship. And so every time we go there, I think, wow, I wonder if Sunny Hills would benefit from this. And I'm, this is me, I'm, so I should be ashamed probably. But my first response is, no, I don't think so. And why do I get that impression? Because theologically, and I just asked you, and I know we need stuff like that, but my impression is that's not useful for us because we kind of seem like a group of people who already have it pretty much under control. Now, I'm not asking you if we do, but do you get that impression? If you were visiting our church and you went to our services and you talked with us and everybody said, how you doing? Everything's fine. Family's fine. Everybody's fine. Everything's fine. And you left, would you get the impression that we were a broken people slain at the cross of Jesus Christ, waiting for him to resurrect us and, and make us whole and shine his light through us because, because we bring our brokenness to him? Would you think that the cross was the very basis of our fellowship? Or would you think they pretty much got it handled? I mean, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. I just don't feel like we would be really that comfortable coming up and saying, hi, I'm your minister, and, and I struggle with this hurt, hang up, or habit." I don't think we're comfortable with our elders coming up here and saying, yeah, really, you know, I'm, I'm really having a struggle with this. And we all clap and say, yeah, lay it at the cross of Jesus. I mean, that's what we should be able to do. But I, I don't see it. And so I, I don't know. I don't know how to fix it, but I'm just saying it's, it's possible, isn't it? It's possible that we may not be exhibiting the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll grant you this. I get it. That kind of group, a lot of them are kind of freshly coming to Jesus and working out that stuff. I get that. And, and I believe that many people in this body of Christ, because of the power of Jesus in their lives over many years and even in their families' lives over many uh, uh, family tree uh, generations, I believe that God is, has repaired a lot of stuff. But I don't think that explains it away. <laughs> because even if he's repaired most of it, do we still see ourselves desperately in need of the cross of Jesus Christ? I know I do. And I just, I don't know how to get there, but I believe that we need to be a people where that's evident to anybody who comes in the door. We need to be real. Appreciate Jim was talking about, do you believe in Jesus? <laughs> yes. Do you believe in the cross of Christ? Yes. Do you believe that you need the saving power of the blood of Jesus even now? Do you? Look what Paul says. This is the last verse. For the word of the cross is what? It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to what? Us. Is Paul a new Christian? Is Paul a babe in Christ? I don't think so. But to us, who are what? Being saved. There is a sense in which you are saved and confident, yes. But there's also sanctification. We are in the process of being transformed by the renewing of our minds and and so Paul says, for us who are in the process, the cross of Christ is what? The power of God. We need to live in such a way that people can see that, even if it's humiliating. Because people who are struggling need to see people who have struggled and been raised up. And they need to know it wasn't us who did it, just because we are so good at it. They need to know it's the power of the cross of Christ. If we can minister to you this morning in, uh, in regard to your spiritual journey, in regard to talking about sin or, or, or faith, whatever's going on in your life, come talk to me, talk to one of our elders, and uh, let's start a, a prayerful journey toward resurrection.